Okay, Galatians for beginners. This is lesson number seven. And title of this lesson is How Law and Faith Work Together. Actually, part one. Won't be able to do all of this section in one lesson. But we'll start it tonight. We're in Galatians chapter three, if you want to follow along in your Bibles. Okay, so far, Paul has explained that the blessings of salvation are obtained through a system of faith, not through a system of law. It is our association by faith with Christ that enables us to share in His blessings. I'll give you a, 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 you know, a human example of how this works. It's like marrying someone who is wealthy. You share in the wealth by marriage, not by merit. That's the, that's the essence of the gospel. You share in the blessings that Christ has by faith, not by merit. And with Jesus, there's no prenup. <laughs> no prenup. And baptism is a person's wedding ceremony where he or she is united to Christ. I mean, it's a, the, the example you know, really works. You marry, into, you marry somebody who's wealthy, you love each other, everything is wonderful, you know that's the one, and it's a true love, it's not about the money and all that kind of stuff, but you don't become, you, know, you don't marry into that money until the wedding day, until you sign the contract and you do the I do's, you're not, you're not married. Same thing, baptism is a person's wedding ceremony where that person is united to Christ and comes into all of the blessings. All right, so last week we started discussing some of the blessings that are obtained by faith and how to keep these blessings. So Paul has mentioned two so far, the blessing of righteousness, meaning right standing with God, that's a blessing, and the blessing of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. These two blessings are obtained, he says, by faith, not by works of law and tradition as the Judaizers were, uh, were, were teaching. Remember the Judaizers, these are the ones, these are the teachers causing the problem. Paul also mentions that we maintain these, we obtain these blessings and we maintain these blessings in the very same way that we obtain them, and that's by faith. I obtain the blessings by faith, but I hang on to them by faith as well. For example, I continue to be righteous before God because I continue to believe in Jesus. Not because I managed to get everything right after I become a Christian. So in citing these two blessings, Paul speaks equally to both Jews and Gentiles who could both relate to these things in exactly the same way. Now in chapter three, verse six, he mentions another blessing received by faith that his Jewish readers would identify more with than his Gentile readers. And that is the promise of Abraham. This is a third blessing received exclusively through faith in Christ. You see how the Jews would kind of understand, whoa, wait a minute, the blessings of Abraham, we get the Gentiles, not so much, you know, unless they were familiar with the Jewish religion. But the Jews, this, this was new, not news to them, but this was familiar to them. So in verses six to 29, chapter three, Paul not only explains that the promise of Abraham comes through faith in Christ, but that this promise also comes to the Gentiles in the same way. So before getting into the text, let's first review what exactly was the promise of Abraham that Paul is referring to. The promise, uh, excuse me, now that the promise was made to Abraham and said that he would receive, what would he receive? Well, the promise to Abraham was that he would receive protection from God, from his enemies. He would receive a great nation descended from him. There would be a land that would be, you know, belong to him and his descendants. And he would have blessings for himself and, and, and all the nations would be blessed through him. That was the, that was the promise to Abraham. 
Now with time, these promises were summarized by the Jews as being the assurance that they were God's special children and that their land would always be theirs and always be protected by God. Now I want you to hang on to that idea because that false notion that they had you know, uh, drove them to do a lot of things. They thought that the promise to Abraham meant that they, as his descendants, were going to be the special people all the time and that they will always have their land. To this day, <laughs> to this day, they think that. So Paul is going to explain in this passage, however, that the true essence of the promise was that Abraham and his descendants were being blessed and preserved so that through them Jesus would ultimately come and when He did, all of the spiritual blessings promised would be given to Jesus. He was going to be the recipient of the blessings. Once Christ had obtained all of the blessings, then everyone could have access to them through a system of faith. This was God's plan in distributing the spiritual blessings of heaven as promised to Abraham. Okay? Now in verse six and seven, we read the following. He says, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. So Paul begins by demonstrating that the faith system has always been the principle by which God operated. I hear people sometimes say, well in the Old Testament you know, people were saved by the law and then the New Testament were saved by faith. No, absolutely not. People received blessings, salvation, always through a system of faith, always. Old Testament, that's how God has dealt with man always. Even with Abraham, God imparted righteousness. Why? Based on his faith. He was not inventing something new, Paul here. Paul was not inventing like a new doctrine. The gospel was not inventing a new system. It was merely fulfilling the system which had always been in place, but had not yet been fulfilled. Big difference. So sons of Abraham were all of those who arrived at righteousness in the same way that Abraham arrived at righteousness. And how was that? Through a system of faith. That's how you became a son of Abraham, a thing that the Jews missed, that Paul talks about in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Verse eight and nine. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. So the heart of the gospel message, the good news is not that uh, Jesus is Lord, I mean that's a good thing, but that's not the good news. It's not, the good news is that through Jesus the Lord, salvation is offered to man based on faith. Otherwise, man could not obtain it. That's the good news. Paul says that God knew that this universal message would one day be preached and began by preaching it to Abraham long before there was a distinction between Jew and Gentile. That's his point. Salvation by faith, obtaining righteousness by faith, this existed long before there was a difference between Jews and Gentiles. So as the first one to hear and believe the message, this is how Abraham would himself be blessed with righteousness. This is how Abraham would be the spiritual father of all those who would respond the same way. How? By faith. Abraham's descendants were not just cultural Jews. They would be the people who would be justified by faith. Ultimately, all nations would be blessed 
because the Lord would obtain salvation and would offer it to everyone through faith, just like He offered it to Abraham through faith. So Paul, you know, he brushes aside the, 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 the Judaizers and their argument of the necessity of becoming a Jew first by saying that only through his gospel could one truly become a son of Abraham, a real Jew. I mean, the, <laughs> the counter argument that he makes is, is brilliant. <laughs> These Judaizers are saying, you need to become a Jew first if you want to be a Christian. You, see? you want to be acceptable to God. And, and, and if you're going to be a Jew first, you've got to be circumcised. And Paul comes back to them and says, the real Jews are the ones who believe God. They're the true sons of Abraham. <laughs> There's your answer. Now Paul, continuing, confronts, uh, or, or rather contrasts, the system of salvation by law keeping. Verse 10, he says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. So what is he doing here basically in this? He's comparing. He said, this is the system of faith. This is how it works. Faith unto righteousness. This is how Abraham became righteous. This is how you become a son of Abraham through righteousness. So, okay, now he switches gears. He says, okay, let's take a look at the law. Let's see what it does. Okay. And so he says the law was given for what purpose? To reveal sin and to condemn sinners. So anybody trying to justify themselves through law keeping had to perform perfectly. There was no grace. Any failure led to condemnation. There's no grace in law, none whatsoever. You know that, if you, if you get caught, you know, you're, you're, you're in a 30 zone and you forget where you are and you, you zip through at 50 miles an hour, there's no great, but officer, you know, my, I was going to be late for my doctor's appointment or What does the sign say, sir? 30 miles an hour. How fast were you going, sir? Uh, 52. Okay, case closed. There's no grace in law. There's no grace in law. Verse 11 and 12. Now that, no, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. So Paul argues that scripture itself, meaning the law and the prophets, scripture itself teaches that righteousness comes through the faith system, not the law keeping system. The gospel he preached did not violate Jewish theology. That's his point. I'm not a false teacher, he's saying. I'm not contradicting what the scriptures say. I'm not contradicting what Moses said or what the prophets said, because all of them testify to the idea that faith, uh, that, that salvation, righteousness, blessings, they come through the faith system, not through the law system. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now he's really talking to the Jews. See, one of the obstacles to the Jewish mindset was that the Savior was crucified the way he died. His death, and especially the manner of it, did not fit the image of a glorious Savior that they expected, and also it seemed to violate the scripture concerning someone who was executed. That was a real problem for a very sincere Jew. He like, whoa, how, how does this work? Because in Deuteronomy, and we're going to just flip over there, we're going to read where this is written in Deuteronomy. This is part of the law. This is the stumbling block that the Jews had, because they knew that in the law it said the following. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day. For he who is hanged is accursed of God, so that you do not defile your land which the Lord your God gives you an inheritance. It's not the idea that it's a wooden tree, it's the idea if a man is executed, he's hung, 
Okay, what does that mean? Well, he's a criminal, he's a sinner, and he's been put to death, capital punishment. He's like a bad guy. And so the Lord that the Christians were raising up, how did he die? Well, he died on a tree, a cross, but he died as a, as a what? As a criminal, he was condemned. He was executed by the law of the land. So the Jews were having a hard time with this. Even the very sincere Jews, you know, it's like, hey, I want to believe, but whoa, how do I get around this scripture? How does this work? So Paul explains Christ's death is the price needed to be paid in order to release men from the curse of the law. So let's digress a little bit more. What is the curse of the law? Well, the curse of the law was that everyone's sins were revealed by the law and thus all were condemned to death. That's the curse. Even with this knowledge, men were helpless to stop sinning or remove the punishment that hung over them. That's the curse. The law didn't give you the power to stop or to provide any way to appeal to God for mercy or forgiveness. That's the curse. So the law revealed your sins and then the law revealed what was going to happen to you because of your sins. But it didn't give you the power to overcome your sins and it made no provision for grace to forgive your sins. That was the weakness of the law. So Jesus comes along and he annuls the curse in three ways. One, he lives a perfect life and thus fulfills all the requirements of the law once and for all and for all time and for all men. Two, he offers this life to pay the price of death, the moral debt owed by all men on account of their sins according to the demands of the law. And three, he promises to give the spirit to all men in order to give them the power to overcome sin and to overcome death. So the curse is eliminated. So Paul explains Christ's death as the curse that he bore, he doesn't say his death wasn't a curse. It's just that it's a curse that he bore, not for himself, but for us. Yeah, he was, he was crucified on a tree. Yes, he was executed. Yes, it looked like you know, he was a criminal, so on and so forth, but don't you realize the curse wasn't on him, the curse was on us. And he took our curse on himself. It was a shameful thing indeed to die on a tree as the scriptures said, but Paul says that it was our shame and our deserved curse that he innocently bore for us. So Paul doesn't contradict the scripture. He doesn't do like a lot of modern you know, theologians and uh, you know, interpreters do. They don't like that scripture and they say, well, it doesn't really mean that. You know? You know, the latest thing, you know, the big uh, gay rights and so on and so forth, and we have gay theologians, and the only way they explain away, you know, if, if, the, if the Bible says, you know, uh, if a man lies with another man as he lies with a woman, that's homosexuality, uh, it's an abomination. And, and then you'll have some, you know, apologists come along and say, well, it doesn't really mean that. <laughs> really? <laughs> or whoever wrote that wasn't inspired. Really? Or Paul doesn't do that here. He doesn't say, oh, it doesn't really mean that. No, no, he says, it really means what it says. Cursed is the man who, who is hung on a tree. The only difference is that Jesus was bearing our curse, not his curse. Ah, you know, the light comes on, ah. This is the idea of, a, of atonement. So as I say, he doesn't contradict the scripture, he explains it in relationship to Christ's work on the cross in order to help the Jews see the cross um, as a shameful thing indeed, but it was our shame that he bore, not his own. And as I say, that's the whole idea of atonement. 
vicarious atonement. Someone else pays the price for what we did. All right, verse 14. He says, in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So he kind of brings back the idea of the Gentiles here. Once the curse had been removed, everybody now could be blessed. The Jews had access to righteousness because the law that condemned them had been fulfilled. The Gentiles had access to righteousness because the law that had limited them was now removed. So both Jew and Gentile had access to all the blessings, including the blessing of the Holy Spirit. How? Through the faith system, a system that both of them could equally access. Verse 15, brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. So after establishing the idea that salvation through a system of faith has always been God's way of dealing with man, Paul begins a new thought in verse 15. He explains a principle of law familiar to both Jews and Gentiles. He says that when a covenant, a covenant's a testament, a will, okay, he says, when a covenant is made and ratified, you can't undo it. You, you can't change it. Once you make the will and everybody signs, you, you, can't, you can't change that. You can't do this with man-made laws, let alone God's laws. His point is, boy, if you can't undo a man's testament that two men make or family make, imagine if you try to undo God's testament. So in verse 16 he continues and he says, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. So in this verse Paul makes his point. The promise, the covenant was made by God with Abraham. This covenant was established. The essence of the promise was that the seed of Abraham would receive the promised blessings, Genesis 22, 18. In, verse nine, in, 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 the, in this passage here, Paul explains that the seed of Abraham was Jesus, not the Jews. The Jews were under the impression that they were the seed. They were the inheritors of the promises. They were God's people and God was guaranteeing that their land would always be their land forever. But they, they misunderstood. As Paul explains, Genesis doesn't say seeds, plural. It says seed, one, not many. Not many are going to inherit, one inherits. So the essence of the promise was that the seed of Abraham would receive the promised blessings. And he explains, as I said, that the seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ. The blessings were not intended for the Jews alone as a special nation, but rather for Jesus Christ who would come out of this nation. The role of the Jews was to provide a cultural you know, a stage, I call it a stage, a cultural, social, historical stage upon which Jesus, Jesus would enter. As I've said before, he had to be something. God was going to become man. What was he going to be? A Hittite? A Canaanite? A Jebusite? What, what was he going to be? So God says, he's not going to be one of the existing nations. I will create a nation just for him. So he picks one guy, Abraham, and out of Abraham and his descendants, he creates this nation with their laws and their culture and their worship and you know, that God has prepared for them. Their land, temple, everything is there. So when God comes as man, what does he do? He puts on the cloak of Judaism. That's who he is, a Jew. A special nation made just for him. The terrible thing is the special nation made just for him ends up rejecting him. That's the terribleness of the sin.
So in verse 17 he says, what I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later after Abraham does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God. In other words, when Moses comes along and brings the law and all of that, that doesn't eliminate the covenant that God made with Abraham. Doesn't, doesn't take that away, which may have been one of the arguments of the Judaizers. See what I'm saying? So four centuries after Abraham, Moses led the people out of Egypt and God gave Moses the law. So it says here, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. The Ten Commandments and the, the temple worship and all of that, that does not nullify the promise that God made to Abraham. Christ was still to be the recipient of the blessings and the faith system, the manner in which all would have access to them. The law did not change this. Verse 18, for if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So the blessings were promised and received by faith, but if this system is changed and now they are obtained by law keeping, oh, two things are going to happen. One, you have added and changed God's original covenant with Abraham. You're not allowed to do that. The original covenant is the blessings are promised to the seed and they are obtained through faith. You can't change that to now the blessings come through the law. You can't do that, he says. And they are no longer gifts based on a promise, now they're going to be earned. You're going to earn them. Verse 19, why the law then? You know, normal question. Why do we go through all of this? The law, the sacrificial system, the priesthood, the temple, why do a, a, a quadrillion sheep have been killed? You know, beef, come on. Why the law? He says, it was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. So Paul answers the natural question that might be posed to him at this juncture, then why was the law given to the Jews? And he explains that God gave it through the angels by a mediator, the mediator was Moses, and he gave the law for several reasons. First of all, because of transgressions. Meaning, he gave it so the law could reveal sin, show men that they're sinners, to reveal transgressions, to reveal sin, also to mitigate against evil. Why did, why did the, uh, Moses say to People, uh, well, if you give her a, a, a decree of divorce, you know, if you divorce your wife and you give her a, you know, give her a divorce decree, well, why did he make that rule? Well, he made that rule because you know, men were simply abandoning their wives. They were simply throwing them away. And once these women were put out, they had nothing. They had no legal status. They couldn't be married, nothing. They were you know, homeless destitute. So Moses you know, adds something to the law and says, if you're going to divorce your wife, you have to give her a certificate of divorce. This at least gives her some legal status. She can then be married to another person. She can't be taken back by that husband. You know, you, you can, no. So he wasn't solving the problem of adultery. He was simply trying to mitigate the impact of adultery on that society using the law. I just give that one example, but that's another reason for the law. People drive their cars too fast, so we have to post up. Would we need to have speed signs everywhere you go if everybody drove kind of slowly? Well, no, why do we have speed signs? Because without speed signs, we, we go as fast as we can go. Without stop signs, we just go barrel through those four-way thing. You know, we take a look real quick and zip on through. It doesn't make us better drivers. 
the, these laws mitigate the evil. And also, the law was given to reveal the condemnation because of transgression. That's why it was given. This is what's going to happen to you because you break God's law. Another reason, more reason, to, another reason why the law was given, to prepare for Jesus, the seed. The law revealed God's way of dealing with sin. How? Through atonement. What did the sacrificial system teach if it taught anything? Well, it taught the system of atonement. An innocent, innocent is really not the word, there's no such thing as guilty or innocent when it comes to an animal, but a life, it's a living thing, a life was substituted for another individual. So through atonement and the sacrificial system, the Jews were taught how God dealt with sin. And they also learned that atonement requires death. So in verse 20, he says, now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. In other words, the law didn't replace the promise. It didn't change the promise in any way. And the way it was given demonstrates this. The promise was given directly by God to Abraham, one on one, as a covenant is done. The law was given to the people from the mediator, Moses, who received it from God amid thousands of angels. So the law was not an addition to or a limitation of the promise, but a divinely appointed temporary measure whose purpose was served when Jesus came. The law was temporary. That's his point. Verse 21 and 22, finish up here. He says, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be, for if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So even though the law doesn't change the original promise to Abraham, and it doesn't cancel that promise, Paul is quick to add that it doesn't contradict the promise and it doesn't work against the promise. It works with the promise. Paul merely points out what it was not meant to do and that was to make men righteous. The law was never given to make men righteous. Why? Because the law cannot make you want to be good. It can make you try to be good in order to avoid punishment, but it can't make you want to be good. Only the grace of God makes you want to be good. So the law was brought in to prepare men to understand their own sinfulness and how God was going to deal with that sinfulness through Christ and then offer righteousness through a system of faith as originally promised through Abraham. So you had the promised Abraham, you had the law given to prepare people until the seed arrived, and then the promise to Abraham would be fulfilled through the seed, through Jesus Christ. Uh, let me just do this. First, the promise, then the law to prepare men for the promise, then the fulfillment, which is, which is Christ. All right, I'm going to stop there again. The section is too long to do in one shot. Next time we're going to see Paul explain how both of these systems, law and faith, how they work together to bring us to Christ and to salvation. So we're going to stop right there for this time. Thank you very much.